We're going to talk on Meet Your Neighbor, courtesy of United Supermarket here in Milshu with Kelsey Beggs. And Kelsey, you returned earlier this year from where? I went on the world race. And what does the world race actually mean? It's a mission trip to 11 countries in 11 months. 11 countries in 11 months. And you were a missionary on this trip. Yes, ma'am. We partnered with organizations inside each country and assisted them in whatever they needed. I see. And now you're a Milshu High School graduate of what year? 2005. And what year did you graduate from Wayland? I received my bachelor's in 2009 and my master's in 2011. From Wayland, both? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. And so... Uh, Then after you graduated from college, what did you do immediately? I was working in the financial aid office at Wayland for, I guess, two or three years. Uh And uh, so did you apply to uh, be a part of the World Race? There is an application process for the race. A friend and I found it online and did a little bit of research and then um, went through this online and phone interview process. Uh And we are sitting in the home of Suge and Frank McCamish, and Frank is your grandfather. Yes, ma'am, he is. And you lived with him, actually, the last few years or a year of your high school career, right? Yes, we lived with him the last year of high school and have, I guess, come home to wherever he is for the holidays and stuff. Uh huh. And your mother is who? Beverly Beggs. And where does Beverly live now? She's in Slayton. In Slayton? Mm Mm-hmm. And what does she do there? She works for um, Early Childhood Intervention for the Lubbock ISD. I see. And so now, tell me about some of your adventures as a missionary in 11 countries around the world. Wonder where they got the name World Race. When it first began, from my understanding, they didn't have a plan. They would go to a country, and then um, the next country they went to, the participants would race to the airport or the train station or however they were leaving that country. Um, So they just, it was a group of people that wanted to do missions around the world, and they started looking for organizations to partner with instead of bringing their own mission into each country. I see. And so now, uh, the world race for you started when? Um, I left last July, and I went to Nepal first. And what did you do in Nepal? We hiked a lot of mountains, um, and we did, I guess, what you would consider evangelism. We did youth programs and would go and do house churches for the small amount of Christians that live there. Uh-huh. And so um, how did you feel going to another country? Now, you had been to another country, though, before, uh, hadn't you? Yes, I'd been to Kenya three times before with Wayland. Uh So it was exciting, but it was also, there was a lot of anxiety and nervousness about it because the people I was traveling with, I had met the month before Uh for a week. And how many were there? In my group, there were 43 total. And then they separated us into teams of five to seven. So I had seven people on my team. Uh And we didn't know each other that well. And we're just kind of thrown into this new country, new food, new culture, um, just new everything together. And and so how, how do you tell somebody about Jesus Christ? In some countries, you have to be very careful because they're closed countries. Mm -hmm. So... And then we had a language barrier in most countries. So unless our host introduced us to them, we really didn't talk to a lot of people. Um, And they would um, get people interested through the kids. We would have little kids programs, and they'd go home. And then um, if they followed up with them, then they would invite them to church. And that's how we did it um, in Asia. And we also um, passed out the little tracks and stuff Mm -hmm. as well. In their language. Yes, in their language, uh-huh. always. Could you speak any other language besides English? Um, I am proficient enough at Spanish that I can make my way through. And I would pick up, they usually try to teach us the greetings. So I learned the greetings in Nepal and India. Well, greet us in 
Uh, what is it, the language of Nepal? Um, it's Nepali or Nepalese, depending on who you talk to. And they, for a Christian, they'll say Jamesy, which means God with you. But if you're not a Christian, you don't understand. That word doesn't mean anything to you. Uh-huh. So they kind of made up their own word. Um, in India, it's Wandanalu, which is the Telugu language of the area where I was at. That's the only word they taught us, so that's all we said. That was our thank you, our have a good day, hello. That was everything for us. <laughs> um, in Thai, Thailand and Cambodia, I did try and learn some other languages, but they're very similar. I don't know. I can't remember them right now. I can remember a phrase, but I don't know what country it's from. <laughs> so, um, And then I didn't pick up language again until Romania. That... Um, in Southern Africa, they spoke a lot of English, so we didn't need translation. In Romania, um, Romanian is very similar to Spanish, so it was fairly easy to pick up. And then I traveled to Transnistria, which is part of Moldova, and they speak Russian there. So I picked up, I tried to pick up some Russian to help communicate with our hosts. And then we finally made it to Central America, and my Spanish kicked back in. <laughs> so. That was nice. Which country did you sort of feel m- more comfortable in or like better? I really liked um, Cambodia for my Asian countries. The organization we were with is called Shelter of Love, and it was started by an American. And they take in kids whose parents are unable to care for them or, um, or they're orphans, and they raise them from whatever age they get them from, up through college. And we were just able to do everything with the kids. They would help us do our construction projects. We would teach them and play with them in the afternoon. We taught their English class and their devotionals at night. And then after that, um, I would go to the boys' house and they would teach me Khmer, which is their language there. So I just felt the most connection to those people in Asia. It was easier to communicate with them because they spoke English. Um, they really wanted the kids to learn English and so that was one that I connected with most in Asia and then um, we made it to Nicaragua that was month 11 and it was kind of a same a similar ministry with kids whose parents aren't able to care for them or the government has removed them from their home for whatever reason and we did everything with them again we started at 7 a.m. with a morning run and went until 9 o'clock at night which was their lights out so when I was able to engage the most in the culture and with um, the people around me and just learn more about their language and who they are, I enjoyed those countries the most. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, did you stay a month in each country? Did you stay? It was not? two to three weeks, oh, sometimes three weeks? four, just depending on how long our travel day would be. And so you left in July of last year. What month did you come back this year? We landed in Houston on May 22nd. Of this so year. it was almost a year, wasn't it? Almost, we yes. And so do you get paid? No, I did all of all of my own fundraising for that. My sister helped me out a whole lot. But um, we, I wrote letters, we sold shirts, we sold bracelets. My, we did social media requests for donations for me to go. My goodness, that was something, wasn't it? Yes, it was definitely a leap of faith in knowing that God would provide um, if he wanted me to go. And how much did you have to raise before you left? Um, they do have it set up where you don't have to have all of your money before you leave. I had to raise 7500 to leave the United States. And by the end of the trip, I had to have $16,235 in my account with them. And so uh, was it worth it? Yes, it was. If what was the thing that will always stay with you as the years go on and say you live to be 90 what do you think you will remember about this experience of the world race I think the thing that'll stay with me the most is that I I really don't feel like I did anything on the race but that people who have absolutely nothing would share anything with me in the world and that ministered to me a lot and just showed me a lot about loving others and caring for your neighbor and just showing the love of Christ to each other. 
Now, uh, here in Muleshoe, you were a member of the First Baptist Church, weren't you? Yes, ma'am. And very active in the youth? Yes. And so you grew up in that church. And now what, did you ever go on any mission trips with the First Baptist Church out of Muleshoe? No, there weren't many options for mission trips when I was here. I think they kind of got bigger afterwards. It was mainly youth camp when I was in school. And so where did you go to youth camp with the First Baptist Church? I wasn't able to go because I was working in the summer. <laughs> you, you were making your money. I was trying. I think they went up to Colorado one time for youth camp. I don't remember. Maybe New Mexico. So when did you get this, I uh, say, burning desire to uh, really uh, devote your uh, young life to missions? When I was presented with an opportunity to go to Kenya, in I think it was 2008, it just... I didn't think twice about it. I just went and talked to the sponsor and was like, I want to go. And he was like, okay, if you can get the money. And that experience, the people there just really welcomed me. And it just felt normal. I didn't feel like a foreigner. I didn't feel out of place. Um, So I just really felt like it was some place I could live one day if I wanted to. Um, I will not move to Kenya anytime (laughs) soon. But um, I think God just placed a big desire on my heart just to go and be his hands and feet no matter what that looks like whether it's making beds or helping kids with English or building walls I'll go and do what I can and you did do some construction uh, work in most of the places or all um my first team was a co-ed team and so mainly the co-ed teams do construction so in thailand and cambodia we did construction in thailand we literally made the bricks like sifted sand mixed the concrete and water together and put it in a mold and popped out a little brick for this church to be built and i was on facebook recently and they were painting the church Uh, so that was really cool to see how it's it's a thrill yeah it was really neat Uh And then, had you ever uh, built a brick or thought about how it would be uh, done? I had never thought of that process before. We have it really nice where you can just go buy bricks. (laughs) But if you ever need one made, I can help you out. (laughs) In in the other country, what did Um, you do construction wise? In Cambodia, we did more concrete work. We just put it up on a wall, and then we built, I guess, a patio or a back porch for one of the houses. We leveled out the sand and then broke up some rocks with a sledgehammer and laid them out over it and put concrete on there for them to have a place um, to hang their laundry to dry. Now the world race goes into a country or an area and they partner with another organization is that right Kelsey? They do their best they can to partner with organizations that are already in place. Uh Um, There are some countries where they have a program called unsung heroes and that's where a team goes in to look for new organizations to partner with I see. so so now that you're back uh what are you going to do uh in the next phase of your life i'll be between muleshoe and plainview until the end of september and then i've accepted a position with the fellowship of adventures and missions who's the umbrella program over the world race and it's an internship where i'll have a spiritual mentor Um, a professional development mentor, and then I'll work on a project for Adventures and Missions for six months. And so what kind of projects will these be? I'm not sure what I'll be with because the department will choose their fellow. But right now, um, they have another program similar to the race, which is called Kingdom Journeys. And um, the Women's Kingdom Journey trip goes for six months in the 1040 window. So like India, Asia, where Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism are big religions. And they teach beauty for ashes. I'm not real familiar with it, but... um, it's just to teach women about their inner beauty and um, how God views them. And so one project is one girl taking beauty for ashes and making it separate from that to where we can implement it in the United States. I see. Uh, so think back to all the different foods that you must have eaten. What was the one that you did not like? We had seaweed soup in Cambodia, and I just I couldn't do it. <laughs> But most of the food was pretty good. Um, India, they just literally cut up the whole chicken, so you never know what 
part you're getting. So um, thankfully we ate in the dark and you just <laughs> ate it and or let it fall off your plate. But <laughs> it wasn't there wasn't anything too crazy, I don't think, for me. What did you like the most food wise? I really like chapati, which is kind of like a fried tortilla, a little bit denser. And they have they had them in Kenya, and they also made them in India. And it was like my comfort food, like <laughs> remind me of home. And so um, what did your mother and your twin sister think about you going on uh, the this world race? They weren't too excited at first, but they're very supportive of whatever I do, and they just want me to be happy, and they knew that it was something that I needed to do. So um, I was able to find Wi-Fi most in most countries and communicate with them on a semi-regular basis. So that was well, that's always good. Isn't it? Yes, it was really nice to be able to call home. Yes, it's good that you went in 2014 and 15 because uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, you couldn't have done that. Now, um, wh what is one thing that maybe really touched your life and made you a better Christian? on this world Christ. I think there was there was one couple in India um, we would pray for everyone in the little village that we would go visit and I believe they both had HIV and they asked us to pray for them so we prayed for them and they tried to give us fruit and sodas at that time and we did our best like not to accept them but they came and found our whole group later and had sodas and everything for us and we had seen um, their house their building that they lived in and there just wasn't much at all but um, they had spent money that they probably wouldn't eat for a week just to buy us sodas to show that their gratefulness so I think just seeing people's selflessness around the world that there doesn't have to be a barrier between language or race or countries or anything that we're all the same down under and we just want to be loved and we can all be caring of others and selfless and when you came back to America, and more especially to Milshu, are you more grateful than you were when you left a year ago? I hope that I am. I'm sure there are some times where I'm still selfish and think I deserve things a certain way. But after living without air conditioning or without foods that I want or just the ability to go and buy a soda whenever I wanted to. I think I do um, have a greater sense of appreciation for just the little things in life, like a washing machine and dryer and stuff. What was the worst condition that you experienced uh, or saw? Um, there, most people, um, the especially in the rural areas where we would go they don't have floors to their house it's just dirt and then it's just some poles um usually with like tin roof or something on them and all their food is prepared outside um, but you'll see them cooking um f for like a family of six and there's just not much food for them to eat and things are just always dirty like they don't have a way to get it clean but yeah that was probably the worst when you came back and the first meal that you had in America, how did you feel when you were eating? Did you have any uh, gratitude there for food in America? Or did you have any recollection of what you had seen and experienced in those months before? My first meal back was really good. It was a hamburger, and I hadn't had beef in a while, so or like real American beef. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely like a greater sense of appreciation for that. But when um, we would receive the check, that's kind of when reality hits. Most of the time on the race, um, we kind of budgeted $12 a day, and that would c include food, transportation, and lodging. Really? And like in America, it's hard to get a meal for less than $12 oh, at a time. So that was kind of hard to to see and like deal with i'm sure that was that that's amazing twelve dollars a day for everything for for most places um just the way the race works and who they organize with they try and get the cheapest lodging and everything so um if the 
if the host cooks for us, we're able to make that work yeah. a lot. The host being a person who actually lives in that country and you're staying in their private home? It's not always their private home. Um, some places it was their home and they were nationals of that country. Other times um, we lived in a separate place from like our English speaking host. And um, then we, some of us were blessed with missionaries from the U.S. or from English speaking countries that had moved to whatever country we were at. Uh -huh. But um, sometimes we stayed in their homes and sometimes we stayed in a separate place. It just depended on where had room and bathrooms and safer places for us well thank you for sharing these experiences with us it's it we admire you a young lady how old are you now i'm um how old am i I'm 28. <laughs> I can't believe that you're even that old. <laughs> but uh, time passes, doesn't it? 28 and uh, wanting to do for others and to share the word of Jesus' life. And uh, I th think that's admirable. Tell us uh, about your sister. You have a twin sister who was also reared here in Milshoe. And uh, tell me uh, about uh, what, where she is and uh, where she lives today and where she's working. Um, my sister, Ashley, currently lives in Plainview. She also graduated from Wayland um, with a degree in political science. And now she is working for a lawyer as a legal assistant in Plainview, and she is engaged to get married in October. Oh, good. So will you get to go to the wedding? Yes, I'm in the wedding, so I'll yeah. be there. <laughs> <laughs> good. And you're moving to Georgia the end of September, right? Yes, ma'am, I'll move for my fellowship. Um, I have to be there September 25th. Okay, well, good luck to you on the next phase of your life. And this has been brought to you by United Supermarket here in Milshoe, 8th and U.S. Highway 84 on Meet Your Neighbor. And it's with Kelsey Beggs. And she's the granddaughter of Frank McCamish here in Milshoe. And she was reared right here in Milshoe also.